had a combative relationship with KD, which is when I first noticed him and really liked him. Uh, subscribe today, houseofstrauss.com. Um, and we'll circle back. The, in fact, let me start with that. So uh, I theorized that um, Bob Myers had such deep, visceral relationships with Clay Stefan Draymond that he just couldn't bring it to himself to blow it up. That they brought in Mike Dunleavy Jr., an understudy, he could more easily navigate that because he doesn't have those, you know, those deeply embedded relationships. I could be totally wrong on this, but for Myers to leave in his prime was different. Do you think the Clay? Because I don't, I couldn't pay Clay Thompson max. Do you think that component is part of Bob Myers leaving? Mm. I think that's a great point. First of all, I, I deny that I had a combative relationship <laughs> with Kevin Durant. I would say it was collaborative. You know, he gave me things to write about. And I gave him things to be mad at, which he seems to enjoy. So it was very symbiotic, that's yes. number one. Um, number two, I think there was an element of that combined with just being worn out by Joe Lacob. He is constantly charging full steam ahead. I reject the idea that the NBA is cyclical. And God, can you imagine the pressure of your Bob Myers and you've helped build this dynasty when you've got this guy texting you and calling you all the time, telling you that he doesn't even buy the premise that it's cyclical and you're staring down the barrel of this Clay Thompson contract and how you have to break it up and rebuild. I think it was easier to move on. And what was interesting about the press conference introducing Mike Dunleavy, and I say it as a emeritus, you know, a grand old man looking back at it, because I'm not in it in the mix, but this is what I hear from the reporters. They were surprised by how good a rapport Mike Dunleavy and Lacob had at that moment. They seem like they formed some sort of bond behind the scenes, and maybe it's a little bit more copacetic than it was with Bob and Joe towards the end where it was starting to fray. Uh, I have I have criticized the basketball culture in America. I think the NFL doesn't coddle as much, but they also have an advantage where players don't come into the league until they're 22 or 23 years old. In the NBA, they come in at 19. I, I would have unraveled at 19. Pressure, fame, girls, stardom. It's a lot for Zion. It's a lot for Ja. If you look at the slow growth stars, Giannis, Jokic, Steph, it's been much more comfortable. We didn't heap the world on them. So Jaw makes mistakes. A second one gets him 25 game suspension to start the season. Um, he and his handlers, according to reports today, think the league's picking on him. Is it enough? What do we do with Ja Morant? Yeah, there, there's something that people need to understand in their maturation. It's that difference between is versus ought, where it's easy when you feel someone's being unfair to you and you go, well, look, you know, it ought to be this way. It ought to be that way. You're hearing that from his camp where this is unfair. They need to reckon with what it is. That's what they need to do. It, look, I, I understand certain arguments. I get that other guys, maybe they go hunting. Maybe they're featured with guns. Maybe there aren't these formal rules about what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. But they have attracted the attention of the NBA. They have put the, I'm saying they, him and his friends, but let's just say Ja, has put his finger in the eye of the NBA after the initial soft suspension for the guns out in Denver. And so in order to get to where he needs to get to, there just needs to be some acceptance that really the problem is you. It doesn't matter if you think it's fair or unfair. You need to make this journey to just accepting that there needs to be a change because with great power comes great responsibility there's so much invested in Ja, so much invested in the American Zoomer, the one American Zoomer who can become a huge superstar. And naturally, the NBA is going to be concerned with how you present yourself. If he wants to be that guy, he's got to accept their terms. Uh, let me do one more NBA question before we get to your controversy. Isaiah Thomas <laughs> reportedly behind the scenes working the deal to bring in Bradley Beal and move off Chris Paul. It doesn't bother me. Everybody's got advisors. He was a very good talent evaluator in Toronto. New York was a mess, but it was a mess for Phil Jackson. What do you make of the stories that Isaiah Thomas is behind the scenes, a puppeteer, moving Chris Paul out of town and Bradley Beal in? So this is going to be a, a Colin Cowherd exclusive. I was going to write this article. I probably will. Tomorrow on HouseOfStrauss.com. Subscribe today. Um, I think Matt Ishiba, Ishiba, I cannot even pronounce his name correctly, but I can tell you that 
he has something I'm going to call the high chair problem. Uh, so Conan O'Brien once theorized that the celebrities we see on television when we are little kids in a high chair on the TV hold an unusual amount of power over us. You look at the owner of the Phoenix Suns right now, and you realize that he's in his early 40s, and he grew up watching Isaiah Thomas at a particular time in the new owner's life. That means, as crazy as it sounds, that Isaiah Thomas potentially just has an unreal, perhaps one could say Rasputin, hold on the new owner of the Phoenix Suns, yeah. and that has people concerned. Nobody else. Other people can sidle up to this guy. Other people can say this and that. They're just not going to have the emotional impact of being this guy's hero who grew up watching the Detroit Pistons. And it's an absurd way for Isaiah Thomas to have uh, wormed his way back into the league. But it is legitimate. And it is something you hear a lot. And it's, you know, you hear people whispering about it that, yes, the NBA doesn't want Isaiah Thomas to have a formal position. Yes, he doesn't technically have a job. But what he does have is influence and it's through the high chair. So uh, the NIL, uh, it, it's like any new business that involved money, currency. Uh, it's the wild, wild west. It could be Bitcoin. It, it doesn't matter. It, it's a little unregulated. Yeah. Now it's getting more regulated. Uh, you got in the crosshairs of a story about this and a couple of really talented and also, you know, um, beautiful young ladies. It, it was some pushback. I didn't really get the controversy. Uh, your thoughts yeah. on the NFL, NIL, where it is and where it's going. And is it is it a disruptor or is it going to be the big dogs getting the big money, the big schools getting the big money? Where are you right now with the NIL? Yeah, it is a disruptor. And we should be honest about that. I believe you should get paid for your labor. So I was not in favor of the NCAA system of enforced amateurism. At the same time, I can admit that this is potentially corrosive to traditions, and now they have a whole bunch of problems and questions on their hands. I mean, I look at those, those Cavender twins. They played for the University of Miami. It's a very strange setup where the best player on that team, Destiny Harden, was making next to nothing off name and image and likeness. But because the Cavenders are huge TikTok stars and one was a starter, but not, you know, future pro level and the other's coming off the bench and they're making millions of dollars. So the main thing NIL is going to do, like so many trends in media, I mean, I, I think you can remember, Colin, people didn't think that you could come to Fox and really power Fox to anything because ESPN was the brand. Right. Well, as technology moves forward, the individual seems to be the one who's getting empowered. And I think that's what we're seeing with NIL. Certain individuals, especially individuals, it's not just about the talent, but who can hold sway on social media and TikTok and all sorts of stuff that those of us of a certain age don't even know about are going to be incredibly powerful as marketers. And they're going to be in demand by certain brands who are desperate to get those young eyeballs. Um, and it's going to be a very strange dynamic behind the scenes for these teams to balance who's making millions and who's sometimes making millions off not even the game itself, it's going to be a mess to sort out. It's going to be a lot to sort out going forward. Yeah, I mean, Logan Paul's a great example. So he's a good-looking kid. Uh, I've seen him do wrestling. I've seen him do boxing. And I'm I'm fascinated with both. I went to SoFi Stadium and, and with my son, and I took him to the wrestling event. He was fantastic. He was so athletic. Yeah. And, and it's I, I tell my, my son's got a much better pulse on it. And I'm like, he's athletic and appealing. And that's enough. I don't know if he's great at yeah. anything. He's kind of appealing. Big, good-looking kid, athletic, big personality, outspoken. And that just works. The only thing I, you know, here's the way I look at almost everything in life. Outrage sells. But things change and yet stay the same. I think NIL will empower individual kids. And there'll be some weird, disruptive stories. But I don't think... We're going to look up in 10 years and go, can you believe that Purdue football dominates the sport? It's going to be the same college basketball and football powers. There will be some unique players. The, the, the basketball player, the, girl, the woman for Iowa, is a fascinating mm. story. And you're going to get these outliers in these unique sports. Do you think it'll make any um, – that it will sway – finishes results the sport or it's just enriching mostly who's already being enriched 
I think it can sway results. And I think if you believe that it's something that can corrode institutional power, disempowerment of the individual, then great institutions have something to worry about. That Alabama football has something to worry about um, when it comes to maintaining their standard. So I think it's just going to be more of a market. It's going to be more similar to what we see in the pros, especially with basketball, where a few people can really swing it. Um, So I do expect some disruption, especially because a lot of these institutions that do really well every year are used to doing it a certain way. I mean, there's the quote that uh, everybody is a conservative about the industry they know best. I mean, they've mastered it. Pat Riley did not want the NBA to end zone defense and was campaigning against it in the early 2000s because he had mastered how to do defense. So I do think it's potentially a disruptor. I do think it's something that can result in some of these programs who maybe weren't on top, rising to the top, and maybe some of the ones that are on top struggling. Ethan Strauss, go to houseofstrauss.com. Fascinating, takes big picture swings on all sorts of things in sports. He's also got the author of The Victory Machine, The Making and uh, Unmaking of the Warriors Dynasty. Put it up there. That's a very good book. Yeah, there we go. His, Thank you. his collaborative relationship with KD is highlighted, <laughs> among other things. My best friend. Yes. Ethan, it's <laughs> always good to talk to you, my friend. Thank you. Always great to be on, Colin. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.